So you just started selling the photos you got? Uh, okay. No, so I got the, uh, it's a Nikon D80. Okay. And my parents, uh, like it was my dad's, and I got invited to work right. at somewhere, and then I started, like, the person I took pictures for. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just volunteering one day, they're like, we actually can't take these without paying you because we're going to use them for promotion and they're actually really good. Oh, okay. They're like, we'd like to pay you, buy the, mm. buy the rights to these images off you. I'm like, sweet, this is a piece of crap, 8 megapixel D60 camera from 2007. Jesus. So, I'm sure I shouldn't be, but, anyways. Yeah, sorry. So, when that happened then, do you find with being, with photography being a hobby of yours, because you, it's a hobby of yours, right? Yeah. It's a lot of yes. passion. Right? But do you feel when you're paid for it, you don't enjoy it as much? It takes the hobby side out of it, or? Uh, it really depends. Like, I've had some really cool opportunities for, for like, shoots. Like, I've done some, a lot of stuff with Earth Dancers in Dance Ontario. Okay. And that's cool. been really, like, more or less, like, over time, it gets really kind of boring uh, for me to just take pictures of dancers all the time. Right. But it was cool because sometimes they gave yeah. me like creative license to take like, hey, we really want to see how you can edit these and make like some cool oh, stuff. Okay, cool. And then I've done some really cool shoots. Uh, mm -hmm. I've done some whitewater paddling stuff, and that's always my favorite because I nice. love whitewater paddling. I've done shoots for art climbing, and uh, like that's a student associations. But like, I find the ones that kind of it can be really repetitive and boring, just taking like clicking a button and right. adding a photo, sending it to somebody. Yeah. But you can make it fun. Like I, I did a couple family shoots back in nice. around Mother's Day. And with that, they were absolutely awesome to work with because the family itself were really engaging and it's fun to. Oh, okay. It's that one-on-one -on -one personal interaction with people that's the fun part, not <coughs> not the actual. All right, done. Point and click part, edit it. Yeah. So is that how you find it's more creative when you do it with people in terms of families or stuff like that instead of just? Yeah, if I can actually like, there's some kind of attachment to the photos. Right. Like I like one of my photos I took with that family was like one of my favorite photos I ever taken because you can really see the. You can see the emotion, you can see like the love that they have for each right. other and how much it like really shines through in the photo and I love mm -hmm. that I can capture that and give it to them. Ah, that's cool. Give them to that. It's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how'd you get into photography? Um, I was in grade 12 at uh, St. Ben's and my teacher made us do a thing called the 2010 Project. Oh yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, we have a friend of mine. Talia. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to her. Talia again. Not watching. Awesome. She follows, but she's not probably not watching. <laughs> um, we had to do a 20% um, uh, like of our time and I, I always was inspired by like National Geographic photographers and all this stuff I'm like, my, and I knew my dad had a camera I'm like alright let's go out and learn it and it's like I spent all my time just learning how to take pictures mm -hmm. like learning how a camera worked and like the, what ISO is, what aperture is, shutter speed all these things and how they work together and I made a blog about it, uh, like pretty much how to get into photography if you're stupid like me. It's like how to. Like, Is that the name of it? No, it was like just like decobla photo photo yeah. blog or something like that. But like more original. I think the uh, like the first blog post was like photography for idiots, and it's like pretty much like here it is, absolutely simple. Nice. And with that, I, I challenged myself to get a whole bunch of different styles of photos, and I really pushed myself and just I probably spent like two hours taking pictures a night. Wow. And I think probably I like two. I still have two of those photos out of the thousands. I just really like it's. It was a good time, but I really like it was. It was a good time learning, but it was a strenuous problem, like a lot of repetitive stuff. But yeah. I had a ton of fun. Now I can take some pretty fun shots. Did you make it? So you made the blog. The blog was your way of uh, document documenting it, yeah. sharing it. Okay, right. Because I remember uh, Talia did it. Talia did hers with Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and that was pretty cool because mm -hmm. I was in a few of them, so like yeah. those ones a little more biased towards those ones, but nice. You're, yeah, we'll put that uh, description link or link in the description for you because I want. That I don't even know if that blog is still no. active anymore. I haven't no? touched. I haven't touched that in years. I find I've been do documenting a lot more. I have an Instagram page, Be Cobla Photos. Okay, and that's where I've been. Like I started posting right after the Twenty Time Project was done. Nice. Once you learned it all and you can yeah, and like, I, I mastered it. It's really cool because I like looking back and seeing some of the photos I took when I just started out right. to some of the photos I take now. It's like it's like I was I was always fascinated by nighttime shots of cars and stuff like that moving, and like how it, like how light light works over the course of time. Right. And a lot of my photos at the start were just taking like uh, long exposures of cars and stars. Cool. And then now it's like 
I find a lot of them were like had a really orange hue to them and stuff like that. And now it's like I can make that perfect. Like I can go and take pictures of the stars. And it's really cool. Two and a half years later, seeing how much everything's changed. Do you have like a specific photo that you enjoy? Like, what's your favorite photo that you've ever captured? I've got a couple that I really like. Um, I've had. I got one of my friend uh, Eric at this summer camp I was working at, and it's him with his telescope. He's looking up at the stars. And it's like, I set the camera right at grass level, so mm -hmm. it's below his back. Nice. And it was a beautiful starry night in Maine. Do you have the photo? I do. I yeah. want to see this. Um, yeah, so you said in Maine? Uh, in Minden. Oh, in Minden. Yeah. Cool. Um, and we looked up at the stars, and it was just like, it's him like that. Like, that's the. Oh, shit. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Damn. I get it. That's a pretty sweet shot. Yeah, I love taking pictures like that. It's a pretty sweet shot. And yeah, that was like one of my one of my favorite uh, series. And then this is probably my second one. I'm a really avid canoe tripper and working on that front. And then I oh uh, damn, I snagged this one on a uh, Dudney Lake. Uh, just kind of like that's so cool. Northeast of Sudbury. Damn. Oh man, because I want to show you. Um, a couple, actually, I'll show you mine from. My account with my buddy, my buddy would take photos of me back when he was in Sudbury, and he's taken a few pretty sweet nighttime ones of okay. myself, so I'm just going to find those real quick. Um, here's my favorite one that he took. That's a sick shot. Yeah, yeah. he's unreal with those ones. That's, yeah, like that's like very much my style. Like oh like, shit! Just that nighttime <laughs> like star long exposure stuff. That's pretty sweet. That was like, I think that was like a, only a 15 seconds. Yeah. And it was like not a very wide aperture. It was just showing how bright the, bright the stars were. If I had it open for any longer, it would have just completely like, we were in a city that had like one traffic light and no, like no city lights. So oh, it was like, perfect. it's like, and there's no like, light pollution. Closest town was like Halliburton, which is 30 K away. Yeah. And still there's like maybe 18 people there. Yeah. There's like no one in Halliburton. Just and then taxi drivers. It's just summer camp yeah. and cottages. Pretty I much. Think. Yeah. It's cottage country. That's crazy. Man, uh, remind me after the show, <laughs> I'll link you up with um, my buddy James because he's very, like, we'll, we'd go on adventures together and shit. And then when we'd go on these adventures, he'd just be taking photos and that's the similar style. Mm -hmm. like we were out till probably, as you can imagine, like. You don't just go at 11 o'clock at night no. and take those photos. Actually, for me, the prime time to take star photos is between like 10.30 and uh, 10.30 and like 11.30. That's in the earlier summer just because of the position. Of the, right. the, the moon drops down a little lower and then okay. it comes back up. I find if the moon's too high, you get too much uh, bleed. So I, and you either got to go earlier in the night or late at night. Yeah, I mean, like you gotta go like at yeah, two or three. Yeah, we went at like one thirty and then stayed. Like, if you can go at like if you have the kind of that drive, you can get up at like maybe two, like three o'clock, four o'clock, and go up right at the end because then the the moon's gone and the sun's about to come, so you get a bit of a hue to the sky. Yes. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Do you have any photos like that? Uh, not that I can think about. Like I, I think I may have one or two. Um, like hide around on my laptop. Hard part is with like long exposure, like nighttime photography, yeah. is it just, most of the time, it doesn't work out the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. Cause like, you get a little bump in the tripod, the wind sets it off like slightly, and then you get a little bit of jiggle, and it's like, as soon as you get that, it's like, the stars like start to shake a bit. Mm -hmm. It okay. doesn't make as nice of a photo. Cool. Man, I think you'd really get along with my buddy James, specifically in the photography aspect, cause it sounds like your style of shooting is yeah. similar to his, from what I'm Yeah, guessing. that's what I'm, so that's pretty cool though wow so <coughs> you mentioned for adventures and like trips you go on you're in advl right yeah i'm third year outdoor adventure leadership i'm also in teachers college with that sure so how does that how does that work the balance between the two um so what's your week like typically yeah so like the cool thing is laurentian university offers a outdoor adventure leadership program which is one of the best in north america and it's, uh, but it also has a, a concurrent education program. Mm -hmm. Meaning, so you can take a degree like, um, you can take a degree like English. And while you're getting your English degree, you actually take a couple extra, um, you take a couple extra courses of like a semester. Like uh, during last year I had, while I was taking my wilderness first aid and mm -hmm. uh, sorry, wilderness first responder course and outdoor education, 
Uh, of course, I was also taking a education and schooling course on mm -hmm. top of that, on top of the stuff that we need to take for, uh, since it's under the School of Human Kinetics, we have to take physiology, anatomy, and all that stuff. So a typical week would look like I have phys, anatomy, or whatever course it was that semester. Mm -hmm. Generally, some spe uh, specific outdoor courses, like first semester was uh, I had to take uh, Wilderness First Response, Jeez. which is a... Sounds like a, a long course. It was a heavy course. It's a heavy course. It's an 80 hour certification course, and it's pretty much how to keep somebody alive for two days when they're uh, two days two days um, using whatever you can. And then I also take, but then on top of that, you have to take an educa education That's courses. Nice. So ideally, it's 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 five years, and mm -hmm. you get two separate bachelor's degrees. One of human, can, uh, one of uh, physical health and education, and one of them is in uh, just purely education. Nice. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. So why did you choose this program? Honestly, for me, there was like no other choice. Like I, I applied for two programs, and I got into uh, I applied for, I think it's outdoor recreation and parks over at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. Nice. Got a killer, like offer to go there, and it was seemed like a good time. But Laurentian is their ADVL program is like oh, yeah, second second to none. Like yeah. there's like maybe one university out in BC called Thompson Rivers that beats it. Yeah. But Thompson River it's a different kind of school. Uh, and but ADVL program with Laurentian, especially with the Con Ed, is creates some of the highest quality uh, outdoor professionals in the world. Yeah. It's like the equivalent to becoming like a security guard compared to a police officer. You can go to college real quick uh, and get that okay. get that certification or you can spend a little bit of extra time and you get the so I figured that for me setting up a career in the outdoor industry this would be the best pathway to go. Right. It's always been my dream. I didn't, I knew it wouldn't be the one that makes the most money, but it'd be the one that I have the most fun and have. Yeah, and that's really what you want. Live the dream, really. Yeah, yeah. like if, and that's where, and like I had on a couple of weeks, George, <coughs> shout out to him, <coughs> excuse me. He mentioned, cause I asked him, he's like, I was like, where does money fit into like, cause he's a professional basketball player, yeah. right? And so he makes good money. But it's it's also not like Ferrari type, like yeah. driving around Ferrari type money. I think very few professions allow you to do that. And so asking him is like, well, you have to val like find out how much does money mean to you. Yeah. Because if there's a bunch of people who they really enjoy it, for example, like my brother's very like materialistically motivated, and that's like that's fine, that's yeah. him. But I'm not. Yeah. Right. It's like I don't care about new shirts mm -hmm. every two weeks. Like, it's not really my thing. I don't care what brand I'm wearing. As long as it fits, I'm okay with it. Whatever I can get the cheapest. Yeah, exactly. It's like whatever works, whatever. Whatever's cheap. gonna last long and it doesn't cost me a fortune, right. arm and a leg. And if it's Patagonia, right? Wait, hey, Patagonia offers spare trade stuff, which is that's my big yeah. incentive. They last forever, and the products are all actually ethical. They're ethically treated. In fact, the factories they use organic, uh, all organic cotton. It's like no, no preservatives okay. and, and stuff like that. And then as uh, as far as it goes for. Uh, all their staff are well, like incredibly well treated. That's why like uh, the treatment of people is a huge thing for me. Right. So I'm okay with spending like okay, I'd spend twenty five dollars on a shirt somewhere else, and Patagonia's thirty bucks. The shirt itself is gonna last forever, and and it's gonna. So there's a couple companies yeah, like yeah. that that I'll spend that little bit extra money on because I know it'll last right. longer, but not be uh, and it's like it's just a little bit more expensive. Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, it's so like overall, overall. <laughs> so you mentioned something before we like right before we got going about. <clears throat> Specifically off Patagonia, do you find people mention that when you have like you buy brands specifically yeah. outdoor outdoor brands? Do you find people are a lot of like bandwagon brands where they hop on, they see a brand, they're like, oh, this makes me adventurous now. Yeah, yeah. The big there's the big ones right now is Patagonia and Fjell Raven. Fjell Raven are makes those super cute like backpacks that every girl you know has right now. And I have one myself. I was given one as a gift. Um, it was a gift. It was a gift. It was a gift. <laughs> Shout out to Chloe Simic for that one. Uh, <laughs> but they also, the, people think like, oh, I'm adventurous now. It's that Instagram kind of, it's that look at me generation of people that is like, I'm going to put on this stuff and that's going to be my, that's going to be my persona. Not people like myself, my roommate and all the other people I trip with. We wear the Fjell Raven pants just because they're the most functional pants you can wear. They're not right. gonna rip on us, they're gonna be comfortable. They're gonna not get wet, they're gonna dry really quickly. They're gonna be just all around yeah. a really functional outerwear. Not the, oh man, we need we need Fjell Raven because it has that name on it. Right. If Oakley started making a pant like that, I'd start wearing it. 
if Calvin Klein started making a pair, pair of pants like that, maybe not that point. Yeah. You know? If like any company <laughs> made a pair of pants or like anything like that, it's like don't be the brand loyalist, be the one that's gonna be the most functional for what you're doing. That's my approach to it. Like I'm not I have Arcteryx, I have Patagonia, I have yeah. Marmot, all these high end companies. Right. But it's just for the fact that I need I need the quality out of it for what I'm doing. Right. And that's why the jackets are in the upwards of a couple, few hundred dollars. Yeah. Like you can spend a thousand dollars on an Arcteryx coat. I, I didn't get mine for that price. I got mine on not on a really nice pro deal, but it's I, I have it and I ice climb with it, I rock climb, I right. will drag metal stuff across it and all, all that stuff and it's never ripped on me, it's never like it's because if I bought the cheaper coat, I'd need to buy four of those for the one of right. the one I have. Fair. Oh, it's just the stuff I love to talk about. Yeah? Oh I can tell. I'll I'll listen all day. <laughs> That's what I find with podcasting specifically though, is now everyone wants everyone wants to hear themselves talk whether you just people just don't really know how to admit it mm-hmm. so i'm just like well i'll take a different approach and listen yeah for change especially when people talk about stuff that they love and they're mm-hmm. interested in and they're passionate about like with you in photography i just sat there I, I said maybe six words in 10 minutes yeah and i was like oh cool no, yeah. that's two of them so <laughs> that's impressive though mm-hmm. that's crazy but so what was the pro deal uh i i worked in gear stores my whole life oh uh, okay I've worked in gear stores, and then I also certified through Paddle Canada and a couple other different associations, CUI for challenge coursework, right. and all these places offer uh, certain pro deals for staff. Oh, so like cool. instead of a lot of people, places, if you're working at a gear store, they're gonna want uh, the companies that sell their stuff want you to be wearing it. No retail worker making $14 an hour is gonna buy a $900 coat. When they offer them that coat for 150 bucks, they'll be like, yeah, I'll take it. So you have an Arcteryx jacket. I paid about $200 for Valued at what? $990. Yo, 80% off. I would have never bought it. I, if, no, 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 that's so. I, I, like, I'd, I'd, I'd find whatever the next best thing was that was durable in my price point. Mm. That's incredible. Yeah. And you're like, sign me up. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll take that. Nah, easy. So. You said you want to be a professional paddle guy. Um, yeah. So, in general, like I, I've always had kind of a dream of starting like a a guide company out of Sudbury. Cool. Um, Interesting. Sudbury has three hundred twenty lakes in the city, and then right from the outside of city limits is Tomogamy. Outside of there is French River, um, Spanish River, uh, all these. I don't know if I said Clarence, but there's so many provincial parks in national areas, like really close proximity to Sudbury. Right. And we're doing, uh, like, the thing is, is there's not one dedicated guide company that I know that is solely devoted to Sudbury, which okay. kind of sucks. We're hiring people from down south. Right, so which ones are we currently, I guess, affiliated with? Um, that are kind of pulling in? Yes. Uh, we're pulling in from a good guy named uh, Amir Fishman. Uh, his, uh, his company is called Overhang Adventures. Absolutely awesome company. Uh, he's an ADBL grad, actually. Really, really cool guy. Cool. Um, and then we're pulling in like a whole bunch of like freelance people from out uh, down uh, south. I know my prof's wife has a an all female guide company, which is absolutely amazing. Like all females run it. Yeah, all yeah. females run it, and then it's all just like uh, trips for women. They run trips internationally too. Oh, cool! So really cool. Like that's sick. Her name's uh, Jenny, and it's just unreal. Like the stuff she runs. She's just, your boss's wife. Uh, no, she's my uh, prof's prof's wife. Prof's wife, the program okay. coordinator. Uh, absolutely awesome stuff. Um, but yeah, there's no real guide companies like I know I think Mho Adventures does and a couple other places like do trips like in the area right. and maybe like a couple trips out of Clarny Outfitters, but there's no actual dedicated canoe tripping guides to Sudbury. I kind of pitched this idea a couple years ago called 4681 Adventures. Uh, is yeah. the uh, 4681 being the general coordinate coordinate, of coordinate yeah, of Sudbury. Sudbury. Yeah, right. And I want us to create a um, my dream is to create this kind of like um, this platform where we can like pull in guides, and they'll be running out of Sudbury, so offered on a contract basis. Because nice. there's people are spending so much money to go travel in Algonquin Park yeah. and all this stuff when they don't realize the beauty that is. Like there's a, a lake in Sudbury called uh, just outside of Sudbury called Matagami Sea. Yeah, man, the gas. Yeah. yeah, and then Wolf That's Lake's right off of yeah. there, and Chinaguchi and. All these other waterways, Sturgeon Rivers right there, amazing pat like some of the world's best paddling. Yeah, I did a trip on the mountain, I guess. Yeah, you did the loop. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, sick. It's a sweet loop. I've mm. uh, done it. I think I've done that loop 
about nine times now, <laughs> nine or ten times now. I've done about fifteen different trips to that area. Wow. It's a nice area though. It's so nice like that. It's a, such a beautiful spot. So we have all these areas, but we don't have anybody that's guiding to them. Right. So we, it gives it doesn't give like the regular person the, like that opportunity to check it out. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea of sharing by sharing this beautiful landscape with other right. people. It's a good like it's passion. It sounds passion driven. Yeah, specifically. So, so do you find? Do you want to do? Like, be a power guide and lead trips for a certain amount of time to acquire that experience to then build the platform. Um, right now, it's kind of that like weird balance. Like I've I've talked with other guides, and it would be like we could be just running it as like kind of like a cooperative. Like I'd be like the sole provider of the business, and I offer it to people to be like, oh, hey, like, I'm going to offer you a two-week contract to do this trip. Most, nice. most, of the gui- most of the guiding work in Canada is done based on a just contract work. Right. So however long the clients want to be on trip for, you hire yeah, them it's like, like, right. a couple of days before, a couple of days after. Yeah, we do like, okay, you get two days of trip prep beforehand. Right. And so 10 days you hire them, yeah. two weeks. Yeah, and that kind of, that kind of feel. Um, and you just give them contracts based on, like, the, you, on a per trip basis. Nice. Um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Like, there's not much regulation in, in Canada right now as far as outdoor, the outdoor industry goes in that regard. Yeah. Actually, Ontario just released a minimum wage for, for uh, wilderness guides right now, which is really cool. It's a big step. Okay, what is it? Um, for like, a, wor- a, a work day for a guide is very different than a work day for somebody else. You can't pay them $14 an hour. Because they're out there 24 hours a day. Right. And they're oftentimes all their expenses are paid as well. But the minimum, people are sometimes ripping off these people. They're paying them like $90 for, like, they're out there for 24 hours a day, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the new standard is you need to pay at least $140 a day wow. to a guide, which That's is, incredible. in my mind, still on the low end of things. I think right. it should be like 150 170 right. For all their knowledge and like when shit hits the fan. The, the amount of time that somebody needs to put into uh, getting their, getting like what I would say is relevant experience to guide is really, like I'm not even at that point yet. I've done thousands of kilometers of canoeing, but I'm still not fully at that certification level that I need that I would say I'm, I'm proficient enough to be a professional canoeing guide. Uh, you, in order to do that, it's hours and hours, of, and like you, you got to spend at work over years, and you got to spend so much money to get where you are. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. So when you were, when you finish the program in a few years, you do you believe yes or no that you'll have that experience? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you need to have an NLS. Yeah. In my opinion, you should uh, like not put all everywhere requires that. I think people should have an NLS just because mm-hmm. makes sense if you're swimming. Yeah, anything near water just kind of gives you more of a confidence and more of a like that platform of general knowledge. Yeah, take it out because first aid doesn't really yeah. apply in the water. Well, it's a different yeah different animal altogether. exactly. <laughs> um, and then I think they do a, a minimum a wilderness first aid course, which is a forty hour course, and then the uh, I would prefer something like a eighty hour woofer course, like the wilderness first first water, water yeah. like I talked about earlier. And then the relevant paddling cert. So if it's a kayaking trip, whether that be like a maybe sea kayaking instructor mm-hmm. one, or if it's a canoeing cert, it's like would be like a canoe in, canoe tripping instructor one from Orca, or like an Orca four certification yeah. or Paddle Canada, like canoe tripping three, just something like something like those certs. I think it's just really awesome to be have guides that are certified. Unfortunately, there was an incident in Algonquin Park about two years ago where a child died over this over underqualified people and so that's why I'm, I'm huge on the idea of people getting relevant certifications mm-hmm. and all this stuff it was with the Toronto District School Board a kid named Jeremiah Perry drowned in Algonquin Park when he really had should not have drowned right. it shouldn't that like, shouldn't have never happened so what can you refresh people and myself what happened J- from your from yeah what from, you know. uh, from like what the reports I've read have been is they're on Big Trout Lake in uh, which is in Algonquin Park uh, and it was a, uh, it was a high, not a, I think it may have been, yeah, early high school outdoor education class. Okay. And they did a canoe trip, and they went into Big Trout Lake, and a couple of them, a lot of the students didn't pass their swim tests, but still went on the trip, which is absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. That should be a no-go. It yeah. should be a no-go. It yeah. should be either, they need more sort of uh, supervision, they should always be wearing a life jacket, mm-hmm. fill in the blanks. And as far as I'm aware, there was a lack of supervision, uh, but they were allowed to go swimming. And right. this guy who failed the swim test 
who was a recent immigrant to Canada mm-hmm. from Ghana, so had no oh, uh, West swim- Africa. Yeah, jeez, no swimming ex- like experience, and he went swimming, and he went down, uh, and with somebody else, yeah. and never came back up. And it's unfortunate that it had to ha- it it didn't have to happen, and it shouldn't have happened. And it, I think, in my opinion, could have been definitely mitigated with more outdoor professionals on the trip. Put a life jacket on. It's not hard. That'd be like that's literally now he does now that yeah. the problem of him going under doesn't happen. It happens for yeah. like a foot. His body pushes him for a second, he comes right back up. Yeah, there's not much of a chance that God damn. Yeah, no, like even like I live on the <laughs> lake. I live on the lake with a uh, bunch of other ADBL students and last night we went up for a paddle. My lake's super shallow, we can stand up what to lake? St. Charles. Okay, yeah. We can stand up to our shoulders to, for most of it. Um, and then we're out just going for a rip in our playboats, just like working on some rolls and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Damn, that sounds fun. It's a good time. I, dude, I can, I, for the life of me, sorry to cut you out there, can oh, good. not roll in a kayak. And that's yeah. something I need to do. I want to, that's one of the skills that I'm, I'm trying to learn from a skill, like whole side thing. People don't know is I'm trying to learn one skill from each of the podcast guests I have on. Okay. Right. And it could be something that they instruct to me verbally or like last week I had Allie on. Shout out to you, Allie. She's going to teach me how to backflip. Mm-hmm. She's already like talking to me about like mindset to go in. So I'm already like loosened up. She told me it's easier than actually front flipping in terms of safety and stuff. So yeah. that's, that's my skill I'm going to learn from her. So I'm trying to like cherry pick skills. Yeah. No, you can. Come on by sometime and uh, we'll get you. Yes. We'll get you in a boat. Yes. We'll get you I'll bring my own life jacket. jacket. That's too. sweet. No, it's like even we were just going for a quick, quick rip, and uh, we ended up uh, all I'm like, all right, everybody through. It, I didn't even need to say anything. I live with a bunch of people in ADVL, and they all have their PFDs on, ready to, Jeez. ready to go paddling, even though we're just going around the bay. Right. It's just like also I find, <laughs> and I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, but when I when I worked in camping. And I always had my life jacket. It was always my life jacket. It always had like six whistles, a knife. It, it had like my things, right? And yeah. It was a personal life jacket. Do you relate when you guys like are probably all proud of your life jacket? Uh, my well? life jacket is, you can kind of see it here. Um, it is oh, my, my baby. It's oh, like, sick. I have an astral green jacket, just a plug. And it's like this. Spent way too much. I got a good sale on it, but I'm worth like, it. Worth it. But it's a comfiest life jacket. It's got like a big pocket that opens up, and I can, I can put a first aid kit, and then I can write my log books and stuff like that. It's got a pocket for a throw bag. It's a pullover life jacket. It has so many cool features That's to it. Sick. You can rig up webbing to it, and then the belt axe is a climbing. Mm-hmm. You can rappel off your heart. What? Life jacket? Yeah. Stop. It's it's really, <laughs> it's a really sick life jacket. Eighteen thousand dollar life jacket. It's like totally. a good whitewater jacket starts to like two hundred bucks, and they go to like four hundred bucks. And I'm like, I'm like, people spend the money, and once we get them, it's like you're almost flexing your life jacket when you go do yeah. see your buddies. It's like, oh, check this out. Right. You guys are just going to the beach. You're probably gonna be no no more than neck height, but you're yeah. like, no, I'm gonna put my life jacket on. It's like, yeah, so, yeah. Well. So it is a pride thing too. Oh, like, oh, it's oh, definitely a pride life jacket. That's pretty sweet. When you have cool gear, especially in like that setting, it's like I was hanging out with my uh, good friends Jordan and Emily. I guess tell you guys to watch the podcast. Shout out to them. Um, they were uh, we were hanging out, and I'm like, I they work in a gear store in Guelph, and I got a brand new sleeping bag that's like just under a pound, and I'm like, check this out, and I threw it on that. The, we're all geeking, geeking out over like how light my sleeping bag is. It's oh, like, that's wild. everybody likes to flex their, like, you got like this gearhead community that just loves to be like, check this out. Like, check out my gear. It's yeah. like, we got this like pride in like how cool yeah. our stuff is. And like, we want that like next level technology. Yeah. And that's, it's so fun. See, that's the kind of stuff that like, when I worked in camping, I was like, okay, I have to have the most absurd amount of stuff attached to my life jacket. Just a, I had my hatchet attached to my life jacket. <laughs> Outrageous, completely obnoxious thing to do. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna attach this just in case. I'm pretty streamlined. <laughs> yeah, I like keeping it streamlined because I do a lot of white water and I don't want anything attached to it that can actually kill me. Right. Yeah, that hatchet would not be a good. Idea. Well, I don't even keep like people keep carabiners on the shoulder straps. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't ever do that because what happens is if what happens if I flip my boat and I go for a swim, I and I get that that, that gets caught on something. Right. Whether, very well could, yeah. whether my boat, whether it's like a, a tree or something like that underneath, like uh, then that's holding me down there. 
So it's like, I like okay. keeping it like streamlined on the life jacket. Wow. Pretty cool. So, <laughs> that, so, I'm gonna back up to something. So, you mentioned before you started about you had a zip lining job. <laughs> Yeah. What um, was that like? I work in the challenge course industry. I'm certified through CY, which is uh, Challenges Unlimited Canada. Um, and they're a really cool organization. Um, I did a bunch of like training through them. I worked here at the Laurentian University course mm -hmm. for uh, about a year. Oh, the vertical one. Yeah, the vertical nice. course. What's it, what's it cost you getting there? Uh, I'm not too sure what the prices are there now, but like I think it's generally like you do like a group booking. I know with the SGA, uh, there's going to be like a some kind of event that they have like an open challenge course thing or something like that. I'm not okay. too certain. Cool. I haven't been affiliated with them for about a year, but they're an awesome place. Definitely check it out. John's a cool guy in the HK office. Um, and then the, uh, so I got, I, I was working at a camp for the beginning of the summer. I just left because of uh, different reasons came up. But there was a, in order to get there, this camp had a triple zip line that was about 200 meters long. Um, and it was this big platform you climbed up. And then this is really cool because it's one of the only ones in Canada that does this. So you take the zip line and you have to uh, you fly down it into the water as your brake. What? You're, so you're hardest in. And then you uh, get lowered off your rope. Bruh. It's so sick. No! Where was this? Uh, this is in Minden. In in Minden, okay, so yeah. Minden, booyah. Okay, yeah. Next week, I know where I'm going. Go ahead, you. So you're all harnessed in, and like you got like a rope and a greedy, and then we have people on like a thing called an it bike, which is like a like kind of like a water bike, and mm -hmm. like pedal over, and then they unclip you, and then you just swim back. It's a sweet zip line. It's so fun to see the kids on it. In order to get that though, I need to do CUI level two training, which was like a five day course down. YMC I did a YMCA Pinecrest. Oh, okay. And then I had to also do um, uh, training um, with the, the TSSA because zip lines are regulated as a um, zip lines are regulated as an amusement device in Canada, which is really cool. We're one of the people that, excuse me, one of the only countries that regulates zip lines uh, because of just insurance wise. Wow. And so I did my training with the TSSA, which served, and I had to do a whole bunch of supervised uh, like inspections and work on it right. and I came out as a um, I think my actual cert, uh, certification title is zipline mechanic and training nice dude yeah so it's a nice it's a pretty cool uh, shit pretty cool cert to have damn I carry it on my card in my wallet just yeah. let me see it yeah let me see what it looks like, like. <laughs> see what it looks like this, I think I don't know if this is my zipline card but this is my challenge oh, course operator license damn this is cool. See why the credit as professional veteran should sure challenge course technology with it. Ooh, shit. Mm. Full practitioner certification. Operation system dynamic static. Check, check. Special events. Aerial trust drive. Flying squirrel. What's that? Uh, flying oh. squirrel is a system where you have, um, there's, you have, two, you have two large posts. Let focus in. There we go. Focus up. You'll have two things. Uh, you can use big trees, or you can use um, uh, like posts, like telephone posts. Mm -hmm. And they have got a guy guy line cable going to the top. Okay. And it's like we have a good pulley system at the top of it, and it's like a four to one pulley. So you have one pulley at the top, one pulley at the bottom. You attach a bunch of people to the rope. Uh, everybody gets harnessed in and pulls, and then you have uh, like one kid goes, and they like they just run forward as everybody's pulling the rope does, and it launches the kid up in the air. So like they, we call it the flying squirrel, so it just launches them up into the air. Oh, that's incredible. It's so funny. Jeez. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's one. And he's certified in it. Man. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, speaking of that, now let's shift over. You... Do you still climb competitively? Uh, I don't climb competitively anymore. I stopped in 2017. Okay. I uh, I was doing pretty well in the like the climbing uh, comp series. Like I actually I trained with your brother. Yeah. A lot. Um, back in the prime. Back in the prime. I, I was pushing grades. Like I was climbing like 512 maybe like at like on a good day and like some higher boulder problems. And I was like really working. At, um, unfortunately, I got I got injured. I got a hernia. Ooh. Yeah. And that really like I I was coming back from a competition. 
in Southern Ontario, I came second in a tour de block. I'm like, oh sweet, this is gonna be a really good season. And unfortunately it's like, oh. So I got a hernia and then so I had to take three months off and then I got back and I started training a bit and it's it hard to find that drive. And then I got another hernia because it's really popular if you get like one side, like common if you get one side, you're gonna need to get the other side done because right. it's so much stronger on the one side so it pushes a lot more pressure on the other. For people who don't know, can you explain what a hernia is? So I have what's called an inguinal hernia. So it's like on the lower part of my body, like okay. lower, lower part of the abdomen. Okay about the groin and what happens is uh, it's a shift in your abdominal, I think it's abdominal wall and what happens is uh, part of your intestine get pushed uh, and can get into a really in uncomfortable position for your body and it happens a lot to like power lifters, people who are like really avid workmen, people who put a lot of like force on like, and like like a lot of lifting force and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so like I was doing like a lot of like, r like rowing stuff at the time, I was yeah. climbing, I was doing a lot of like physical labor and it puts a lot of pressure on your lower abdomen mm -hmm. and it's just an injury that can like happen to pretty much anybody. Really common in like older men who are like doing like a lot of like like heavy like physical labor. Oh, okay. Like a lot of like mechanics will get in, like with construction workers. But it's just pretty common. Like it's yeah. most, it's like it's only like 50% of men get them in their life. It's not like it's an incredibly painful experience but it's just it's, an, it's more of an inconvenience because it yeah. limits your emotion and you have to go through surgery yeah you gotta get um the first surgery i got in Sudbury, and then the second one i had i because i went to a, a clinic in toronto to get it done oh. yeah Shit. yeah it happens but yeah. and i found like at, even after recovery like i got my last surgery in december and i, I put out a t i got really heavy after that surgery and i i think like, i lost a lot of that like in that time frame, like I lost my joy for climbing because I found a lot of climbing was for me it was not even about like that like going out and enjoying with your friends anymore. Rock climbing yeah. was about beating people and it was about winning and it was about being the best I can do to kick butt and climbing. Right. I hated that aspect of it now because okay. it's like it ruined the fun, it ruined the joy of I'm just gonna go have fun. It's like no, I need to go out and I need to climb the eight. Right. Right. It's a project. I need to isolate myself. On this one climb because I need to climb this grade. I need to beat people. So I really kind of like lost that drive to go to the gym mm -hmm. and climbing. And after my second surgery, man, like I, I just got, I got super heavy. I went up to like 188. What? I'm a yeah. I'm a pretty small guy. Like I'm not. I'm like 510. What? I went up to 188. I've been, yeah. Because I, I was pretty much from the end of November mm -hmm. to like midway through January. All I could do was sit on the couch. Because I was like, I was just in, like, I either was like waiting for the hernia surgery or recovering from it, right. and so I didn't want to move around. I couldn't be too active. Couldn't ice climb. Couldn't do anything like that. So it took a while for me to get back into the swing of things. Once I got active again, like, I really changed up my diet in the last like probably f like six months to like a year. Like I changed my diet up like a hundred and fifty percent. I started being active again, and I'm a bit, like down like one sixty eight, one seventy, mm -hmm. like at that range, or, like that healthy range, and like nice. I've been going out climbing again and kind of getting that love back for just like that having a good time, taking people out, going mm -hmm. outside, and just enjoying the social aspect of it. Right. And it's no longer about that, like, I have to I win. See. Yeah, that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hernias are common, eh? Yeah, pretty mm -hmm. common. Most men will get them yeah. at some point. I feel I'm, I'm like inclined to get one at some point, that's as really much as I don't want to. A lot of the guys in like their later forties will like generally like I was at the clinic. There was a couple other young guys, but like most of the men there were like thirty five plus. Women have women can get them too. It's just less likely. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just yeah. the way their bodies are. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll stay on the climbing topic. You climbed Mont Blanc. Yeah. What the fuck was that like, man? Like, tell us how that kind of got started to. Why you chose that specific climb to everything you can about it? Because that's, yeah. I saw them like, that looks pretty high. Yeah. So it's not your average hike. No, it's, no, it's uh, not. Um, I, uh, I really like um, alpine sports. Like I love skiing, I love ice yeah. climbing, love all that kind of stuff. And I find that like, I was like, all right, let's, let's like think of an adventure. I had a family friend named James. He, we call him the world's richest homeless person. He like would travel around taking teaching contracts in the world, but he never had a permanent residence for a while, so he lived with us during the summers. Right. James had been to... Is that it? Yeah. Okay. He, James would uh, go do uh, 
like he'd take teaching contracts all around the world mm -hmm. and he'd come live with us school and he'd, he's been to like some like 40 or 50 countries yeah and like or some, even more than that but he he said to me when i was like 11 years old I was like i'll meet you wherever you want in the world when uh no when, kidding. When, when you graduate high school me uh, go on a trip and i'll meet you wherever you want i'm like okay um, we were going to go to Patagonia because I really wanted to go climbing right. down there. That's South America? That's like the uh, tip of South America. Right. Um, but I didn't really account for the fact that it would be the winter season and it'd be really hardcore to climb there. It'd be like cold. Minus 40. <clears throat> it, like it's almost Antarctic temperatures because it's so close. <clears throat> no. Uh, I decided, I decided <clears throat> against that one. Yeah. Um, fair. And I was like, okay, where's a cool spot to go climbing? And like everything kind of pointed to Chamonix, France. Mm -hmm. And there's a mountain there called Mont Blanc. Right. And it borders France, Italy, mm -hmm. and Switzerland. Switzerland yeah. um, <clears throat> and I was like, hey, well, this this seems like a cool spot. I texted James. I'm like, hey, do you want to just travel Europe? I'm like, sure. And he says, sure. And we decide, I'm like, all right, let's spend a... Yeah, it was funny. Yeah, I just said, yeah, sure. He's like, sure, I'll meet you there. <laughs> um, but I told him, I'm like, come 10 days uh, like later. Um, and we met 10 days after. So I graduated high school, like I finished my last exam on June uh, 27th, 2017, mm -hmm. and I got on a plane June uh, 30th, and I flew to Fran uh, I flew to Paris, and I flew to Switzerland, I took a bus to Chamonix, hung up there for a couple days. Wow. I was there for Canada 150, that was really cool. I, there was a little Canadian bar. Was there? Yeah, that, I, like, oh, it was a pretty Canadian sweet. themed bar in Chamonix, and I, I I was owned by some Canadian guy, and they were celebrating Canada today. That's wild. So you had uh, a couple of pints there. I'm yeah, sure. hung out with them for a while. Um, went to the Arcteryx Alpine Academy, which was like a, a week long thing they were running there. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We got That's to climb, cool. like, you get some training from like some of the greats, like Hay Hazel Finley, uh, Will Gad, like world renowned climbers, and got to like go to like these training like, workshops that they were holding in the village. That's pretty cool. It was really, really cool. Were um, those free? Or absolutely free. Yeah. No. Yeah. Some of them would cost money to like go up. Like they had some was like, oh yeah, we're gonna uh, we're working on advanced backcountry skiing. Right. If you want to go, come, yeah, but you, you have to pay. You got to pay like okay. a bit to do, go sense. up the, the lifts and stuff right. like that. So but, like it was, free like online training. It's put sweet. on by Arteryx, all of it. <clears throat> and, like they had a bouldering cop in the town, and they had like a hangboard competition. Oh, I didn't incredible. do well in the hangboard. I won the bouldering cop in my division. Nice dude. But it was it was really cool. They had like a bunch of like stuff like that going on. Um, that sounds wild. But then they, uh, like, I linked up beforehand. Like one of the reasons I went to Chamonix is they had a company called Mont Blanc Guides. Right. And it's a six day mountaineering course. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you do is you get there, meet your team. I had, it was the craziest thing. Here's me, this 18 year old kid who's been saving all of high school to go here. Mm -hmm. And like putting all my effort and money and time into this, like getting here. And I've got some of the richest people in the world around me. Like, I've got a guy who worked for the Democratic Party uh, out of, um, in the States. He worked for, like on Hillary Clinton's campaign. Oh, wow. I work, there was a guy there named Jim Ligopoulos. He is one of the leading neurosurgeons in, Oce uh, in Australia and like the world. I like in there we had lawyers. We had a guy, an orth like a guy who owned his own orthodontist thing that like trained what? in the states. So, like, so and I, you just finished your high school. I just diploma. finished high school. Like, what? These people are like, oh, here's a cool thing. And I'm like, yeah, hey guys. <laughs> and like I had a girl who was like a personal shopper to celebrities, like Jenna O'Neill. You know, I still like I still chat with her every now and then. I'm, but she's like in her thirties and she's like, who's this? Jen O'Neill. Jen O'Neill. Really right. cool. Do you, how do you uh, stay in touch with her? I they will send. She sends me like um, like a message on Instagram or Facebook every now and then. Oh, and be right. like, hey, how are, like like how are things? And cool. Really cool. So we end up. Just send her a message. Be like, yo, check out the podcast. Check out the if podcast. You, if you like it, my buddy will come to wherever the fuck you are in the world. <laughs> yeah. We'll sit down. And chat. We ended up um, hang like um, the first thing we did is like we meet the guides and all that stuff. We get our gear um, and we go over to. Uh, we drive to Italy, uh, and we climb a mountain called Grand Paradiso, which is the highest mountain in Italy. Okay. It's about 4,200 meters uh, above sea level. Okay. We climb that in two days. Right. Um, just so that we, we get used to the altitude, we come back down, mm -hmm. have drinks in the village, all that stuff, and then uh, spend the night in Chamonix village. And then we, then it starts Mont Blanc. Right. Um, a lot of my group members decided that they uh, and at suggestion of the guides that they weren't actually fit to climb. Okay. So they they wouldn't just let anybody climb. So it actually ended up being that 
I thought that we had more guides than we needed. So everybody got their own personal guide. There was, um, and then some people joined last minute saying like, okay, I'm going to try it. So there was me, um, with a guy named Neil, really, really cool guy. He runs a, um, a guide company over there, but he works remote now. And he, so I, I was, and Neil was my climbing guide. And then I had, there was Tom. Tom was from Czech, uh, Czech area and he uh like he owned like a, a business over there and he's a really cool guy but he was a machine man would smoke like two packs a day but could climb faster than anybody what he set the comp the guide company's record for speed on the mountain it was wild um and then the, then jen and a guy named dave post really cool guy um they they tried climbing it but they were with just like one other guy they were not favored to actually summit Oh, okay. So we all left at the same time. Um, one guy, actually, Eric, he backed out last minute. Like, he starts climbing, he's like, you know what, like, I can't, do, like, we, he made it up to the hut on Mont Blanc, and then he decided, like, no, we can't, we, and we camped there the night, and then we started to climb in the morning, like, the, the really steep part. We started at 3,800 meters, and we had to get to uh, 4,807 meters. Eric decided, he's like, no, I'm, I'm out, and then the other two were told they had to turn around. We had a very short window to make it work because right. with mountaineering this weather, we left at 4 a.m. We have to be back off the mountain in the hut by 2 at 2 o'clock wow. because the weather. So we started climbing and I, I like Tom, Tom passed me by like hours. Um, and I ended up just climbing up. I spent a ton of like, and it was really, it's a, it's a daunting experience because it's like you don't, you're not, your body's not meant to function that high. Especially right. with somebody who's like, I live at Sudbury, I'm at 280 meters above sea level. Yeah, and then Not, you... I'm at 4,000. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's like every kind of breath is labored and you think you can, it's, it's just walking and like ice climbing a bit. Right. And like just scrambling over rocks. So like pa on paper, it's not that difficult seemingly. Yeah. But then, cause it's like, oh, you can walk, but then you're walking up and you're so high. Yeah, like you're so high, high, you're sweating, right. and then, but it's also nice. It's minus 10 out and it's windy, so you're freezing. It's like this weird mix of like, it's right. so, it's such a mental and emotional battle. And I made it up to the top finally, and it was awesome. But like, all I think about it, I'm like, I just want to go down. Done. They did not hit yeah. me until like after the fact. I'm like, I just climbed the highest mountain in Europe. It was like, it didn't hit me until like well after, because like, that's all I could think. I'm like, I just want to go down right now. That's pretty it's, sweet. It's so grueling. But is the highest mountain in Europe? There, it's, there's, there's, it's the highest mountain in Europe, I'd say. There's two. There's other two schools of thought. Mount, people say Mount Elbrus in Russia is the highest mountain in Europe, but Russia's not in Europe, in my opinion, because okay. it's Russia's an Asian country. But it's because of like interesting. So they there's like contention whether like some people call it Mont Blanc the highest mountain in Europe. In traditional Europe itself, like as in like what we think of as Europe, yes, Mont Blanc is yeah. the highest. Then when you go, like, Russia, like, in the eastern uh, side of, sorry, western side of Russia is Mount, right. uh, is Mount Elbrus, which is, like, 5,700 or something like that. And they're, uh, they're, uh, they're not, uh, people think that's the highest, I think, but it's, it just depends on opinion, really. European Russia is the western part of the Russian Federation, which is part of eastern Europe, but popular, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. So I see what you mean. Yeah. It's like traditional Europe. Okay. Yeah, so Interesting. people say continental Europe. Like, so like, what, like the actual continent of Europe, when not yeah. including Russia. Okay, but Russia's also a lot bigger than Europe as itself. Yeah. That's, that's the point of contention on that yeah. one. It's like, is Russia, is Elbrus, because when people do seven summits, they'll either consider Mont Blanc or Mont, Mont Elbrus. Mm -hmm. So. How much higher is Mount Elbrus? Elbrus is about like 1,200 meters higher, I think. A thousand meters higher, oh, which, sure. is a, which is a big difference. It's a big difference when we're talking climbing a mountain yeah. above sea level, not twelve hundred yeah. meters as like a walk to the completion oh. story. The thing is, think thing about walking down the road. Okay. Now just picture that completely vertical. That's the perspective. It's like that's oh, twelve hundred yeah, okay. meters. Think about think about going over yeah. just give or take like four times around the little wrench and track, but walking that straight as a ladder. Like that's that's the height. Twelve hundred meters up a ladder. Yeah, in like, freezing cold. Yeah, not being able to breathe too well. It's it's cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Conditions wise, sounds that sounds insane. I posted a photo recently 
asking like people like suggestions like where my next like trip should go yeah i'm curious what yours is but before i ask you what have you ever thought of everest base camp because that was one friend of mine commented i was like oh that sounds sick so i'm gonna kind of like i sound really pretentious and douchey when i talk about everest okay how is that i don't think i i would have, i would never go to everest what is that everest is a tourist trap anybody with thirty thousand dollars can climb everest People don't like, I, and I'm saying, like, I'm not saying climbing Everest is easy, but there's, it's not. People say, oh, it's the hardest mountain in the world. No, it's not. No, it is just the, the highest. highest mountain in the world. People, there, I think this year there was like 450 summits, give or take, on Everest. There's about a five day window that you can climb Everest. Mm -hmm. So you're waiting in line. There's a John Krakauer, a famous author, he wrote Into the Wild and Into Thin Air. Yeah, yeah. So he was actually yeah, on I've read into thin air. Into thin air. So he, you're familiar with the disaster that happened on Everest. Yeah, that movie. He took a picture insane. of this lineup on the Hillary Step of probably 200 people. Four people, I think, died standing in that line. I wait in line everywhere else in the world. The last place I want to wait in line is on a mountain. Yeah, it seems kind of silly. Everest has become this very commercialized very idea, like commercialized thing. There's mm -hmm. like 80,000 tons of trash on the mountain. There's this thing where it's like people pay their way up. You get some fever and people, I'm not worried about my own climbing ability failing me. I'm worried about somebody else's who's not experienced killing me. I'm not a very experienced climber uh, in the grand scope of things. But even if I had that time and to devote to Everest, I don't think I would. Just because Everest is like, it seems really cool to stay on top of the world, but at what cost? Like, is it really worth it? When you have this, like, when you've got Sherpa families who are dying for other people, like, you got Sherpas, like, you got Sherpas, like, who are being mistreated, you got guide companies that are just making a killing off this, or people are paying $80,000 to climb this mountain. That's the going price, really. If you're paying sixty to $80,000, for me to climb independently, you couldn't even do, to climb it with, like, a team, right. would cost me still about $28,000 in permits and all that stuff. Wow. So... It just seems like Not really. it's a really cool track. It's a beautiful area. I, I just don't support a lot of the Everest tourist kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. Just because it's like, it'd be really cool. Everest Base Camp, I think, is 6,884 meters, uh, 6,800 something meters. It was really high up. But I just don't know how much I can support I can support like um, Everest tourism myself. Right, it's just too commercialized. It's too commercialized, in my opinion. Um, and it's just like there's a lot of risk associated to it just because of people's inexperience like we talked about earlier It's just like There's so much inexperience there. It's like I'm a neurosurgeon from the States and I make I make millions of dollars a year I'm gonna go climb that risk because this is a cool thing to do. Yeah, it's the same reason people go over and like they go trophy hunting in Africa It's something they can do. Yeah, because they have the money to do it. They have the money to do it I don't know me. Yeah, like it, 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 it bothers me a bit. So like that's why I wouldn't climb it myself. There's so there's so many other great mountains in the mm -hmm. world and so many other cool and in Nepal itself, like there's so many other amazing peaks to climb and places to check out. Like you can do like instead of like Everest Base Camp, there's like Annapurna Circuit where you can do like a trek around Annapurna, oh, which cool. is like a really cool mountain range there over there. Um, and like Annapurna would be like one of my dreams to climb. I think it's like eight, it's one of the eight thousands. Like there's like ten mountains over eight thousand meters. Wow. This would be like an end goal, like in my forties mm -hmm. or something like that. Like your uh, last mountain. Like one of my last mountains would be the uh, like Annapurna. Um, there's like four different Annapurna peaks, but like and some of them haven't even really been climbed like climbed very much because they're so dangerous. But like Annapurna one, I think, has like gets like it's got something like a thousand summits total. Jeez. Just because not a lot of people want to go there because it's just easier to climb Everest, right? Because you just pay your way there and go. Right. And you don't need to trek in for four days, five days. Mm -hmm. um, well, but yeah, like people do that. Like I, my friend James, I was talking about earlier, my family friend that he did like he went trekking in Annapur like on the, around the Annapurna. There's so many companies that'll take you in that area, and it's really cool spot still. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not Everest Base Camp, but it's still really it's high up. Really amazing. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Shit. <laughs> and so there's actually a photo I want to get, I want to ask you about, okay. but as I do that, you posted one a while ago about, I don't know where you were, I 
going to say was South America? Nicaragua. Nicaragua it was in South America. You knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. So, imagine if trees gave free Wi-Fi, we'd be all planting like crazy. It's a pity they only give us oxygen we breathe. I like this one. Mm -hmm. I think I double tapped. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely did. Yeah, sick. Okay, worth it. So, why were you in Nicaragua? Um, so I had a really cool opportunity. Um, my mom's a teacher at St. Charles. I don't go to St. Charles. I didn't go there. Um, but my, I, I climbed with the teacher that runs like the physics program cool. over there. And he was running a trip to, every year St. Charles does a, uh, like a trip somewhere in South America. Or like South America or like that, that region. Right. Um, and it's, it's done as an ecotourism trip. So like you, you pay way on, it's a high school credit. You learn Spanish and you gotta go in. We were there for like I think twelve or 14, thirteen days, oh, and I was there like learning about permaculture farming and ecotourism and sustainable practices over that way. Mm -hmm. And that was like that photo was taken the first night there. I was there on Earth Day, nice. And it was my first day there, and I uh, that was at the hostel we were staying at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And what was your favorite part about the trip? Ah, uh, I love Nicaragua. Like, there's very few countries. Like, I've been to like I think fifteen or something like that now. 16 maybe um, and I always think like oh yeah like, uh, like I, there's very few places I'd like oh yeah it was great to go but I, I don't know if I'd go back Nicaragua is the place yeah. to go back damn I don't want to go to Nicaragua I spent um, I spent four or five five days living with like a local family in like very far remote Nicaragua in a little place called Floto Galpa mm -hmm. and we were working on solar farming like they had solar farm there okay and like they're like we're le learning about that stuff and from them and I was oh. staying with this like family that didn't speak any English at all. Just yeah. Spanish? Just Spanish. Oh, senor! You are on the poco de español. Like, si, sí, uh, go. Uh, so, <laughs> learn as well. So, like it, was, like, it was really cool that experience of like living like completely remote and like, mm -hmm. it's like you are so far away from everybody you know and there's nothing you can do. Really. And there's no street lights, there's no cars really. Yeah. There's you're so far off in the mountains. Like the only thing going through is like a pan the Pan American Highway, and I guess the only yeah. like road going through it. And there's like a whole bunch of dirt roads and stuff like that. We're living in this like house made of adobe, which is like uh, like a, like their clay mortar kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. like, like their version of cement. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like it was really cool, but it's like we're so far away, like away from everything else. So how familiar are you with the rainforest disasters now? I have you seen it? Uh, yeah, so I've seen it. I've been taking that bit of a stance of like, I hate to say this, but almost igno um, ignoring it. In what way? Like, I, I think it's a terrible thing that's going on down there, the fact that there's a, like all this stuff. But I find when it comes to social media, like, I, when there's things like, um, for example, like Notre Dame, or things like the abortion uh, issue a couple of mo a months ago, stuff like that, I really just kind of step away from all these mainstream disasters. I step away from my phone topics okay just because people get so agitated without being uh, without being educated and when you say agitated do you mean people who are like this is bullshit I can't believe this happening yeah you know, like what are they doing or you know, like, yeah people like that so I, I, I tend to like try and distance myself from it because it's like unless I'm willing to educate myself about it and like spend the time and like that effort and like really kind of look at it from all angles I don't want to be the one that's going to get upset about other people for not Right. And I find that I often get upset when I look at stuff. Like I, see, I get upset when I see people's reactions when they're not doing anything about it. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm upset because the crowd's upset. I, I, I think that's a lot. Like, people would, people, sh I think there's people who genuinely care about the rainforest and like genuinely, like, it's a terrible yeah. thing, like, the burning. And that's like, why I went and worked there for two weeks. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's important part. It's people like that actually care about it, but then it's the people that are just like, oh, republished a story because it makes me that I'm involved. Interesting. That those people yeah. piss me off. Like that that upsets me. Like the people that just republish just because it's like this is what's current. And now here's the thing, though. I'm gonna counter your. Argument. Please do. So, because I posted a story about it. However, my intention, and I think what I try to do with this, and in these situations, this one specifically, most yeah, <laughs> less so, but. With stories I try to post because if you read the story specifically that I posted, not many people posted that. I, I did read yours. Yeah. It's an attempt to educate it. Yeah. Right? It's a, hey, this post has this, or this is the guy who's working there in it. This is what he has to say about it. This is kind of 
Because people want quick. They yeah. want quick, they want fast, they want easy. It's that they don't want to do the research themselves, yeah. themselves yeah. right? So if they don't want to do that research themselves, and I've already done enough about re enough research about it where I can f I can channel something or I can I can weigh my opinion in, but since I'm not going to, I'll let someone else kind of educate people quickly. Yeah. And the guy was in the rainforest, yeah. in the post. And so I'm like, okay, he's there. Right behind him, you see the issue. People don't know, they just hear, rainforest on fire and then they everyone blows their minds but they don't visualize it they just blow it out of proportion and yeah. they want that quick easy explanation but they don't want to research it it's yeah. like here's everything you want but won't do look into what this guy's talking about i, I would yeah i'd support something like that a hundred percent it's like more of that like people like i forgot like, there's people like memes and stuff like that like not like memes uh, but about it but like yeah. or people are like just like, uh, like oh like like no one cares about this like uh, like like when Notre Dame like stop you know it's a it's a it's a wildfire right in the building it's no, a, it's not Notre Dame this is a different thing this yeah is a, like stop comparing the two like don't please don't compare them they it's, both are their own entity yeah. that both sucked yeah and sucks when they happen but <laughs> the thing with all that <coughs> excuse me is a lot of people don't. They don't want to educate themselves, but yeah. they still want to be their opinions to be heard. So yeah, you know it's okay to not say something about it, which is why I like your approach, where you're like, I'm just gonna go off my phone because social media does that to me, and you're aware of it. It's something that people don't, we don't realize as as a society that's very harming. Yeah, it's harmful. Sorry, and it's very, very. It scares me. It, yeah, it scares me. I, I would agree. Over it's just this is me, like this like I need to be heard. It's like I want people to be educated, and just because you don't have an opinion about something, it's okay to say you don't yeah. like to not contribute. That's fine. There's that's what one thing specifically with some there's a couple like female friends I had a while ago, and it's like you don't have to always put your input into things. Yeah. It's like oh no, look at me. It's like oh. I did this post when it came to Notre Dame because I was so tired of it. Have you been to the Notre Dame? Yeah, I was there. No, like, you too. Nice. Nice. In popular opinion, people posting pictures of Notre Dame saying they're sad are just flexing that they've been to Paris. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Also, peep this pic I took in Paris because I've. <laughs> <laughs> That's like kind of what a lot of the Notre Dame thing was. Is people are talking about it like it's their grandfather dying. It's like, yo, I've been to. Paris too, but I didn't post yeah. about it. That that was I found a lot of the what like there's two sides of the Notre Dame thing. Both both got me upset for some reason, so I chose to back away from this. Good point is there's yeah. the the side that says I'm upset because it's the because um, Notre Dame burned down, mm -hmm. and then there's the upset people who are upset because somebody donated money to rebuild it. People are like oh spend money on the environment. It's like this guy just this guy spent a lot of his money because he liked this. When to realize it, there wasn't a lot of people that don't. It's not like this mass donation pool. It was like there's people, billionaires donated to this. Yeah, and they donate a couple million dollars. Yeah, it's, it's like five people donate five thousand dollars. It's or five million dollars. It's twenty five like, million dollars. Yeah. It's so people. I, that's why I wasn't upset about people donating. The right. Like, it's like, well, they should spend it on the environment. I'm like, they don't want to. It's their money. Right. Let them do what they want. We can't. Then we no one focuses on the fact that there are people that are actually spending so much money, and yeah. organizations that are spending so much money on environmental issues without right. like somebody donating to a building that burned down, and I'm upset. Right. How long were you in Paris for, though? I think I was in Paris for six days. Six days. Yeah. Just did like um, I was over there with James, and we did like after leaving Chamonix, like we just went like on a tour, like a whole bunch of other like European countries. Like I did like went to. Like, that's fun because I did, like, I had a Euro pass so I could just hop on the train whenever I wanted. That's sweet. So, like, I did nice. one day where I had breakfast in Rome, lunch in Florence, and dinner in Venice. It was the coolest day. That's not too bad. Yeah, no, I had, like, breakfast in Paris by the train station, then I had lunch at, I had pizza in Florence, and then I had seafood at, in Venice. So I did a bunch of traveling around there, and I finished in Paris. I think it was, like, five days or something. Yeah. Something like that. And I, we bought a scooter and we each bought scooters in Berlin from some toy store and just used those to get around. Like a little scooter? Oh, like, yeah. Just like, oh, like, full, like, like kick scooters and stuff. No. Kick, kick scooters. So I used oh, that with a like, big Osprey backpack and just 
I covered so much distance in Europe. Yeah, that, it's hilarious. Buddy and I did. Uh, we rented longboards and we were in Budapest and Barcelona. Okay. And I think next time I go on any of those trips, I want a longboard. Yeah. Because dude, like you said, with it scooters, so much distance. Exact same thing. It's like you cover so much distance. You do two little foot pushes. Yeah. And then just. No way. Like I ended up there's a a climbing gym in Berlin. That's uh, sorry. In, yeah, it's Berlin. And I wanted to just train a bit. Um, um, and just climb while I was over there. And so I traveled, like I took an Uber there and I'm like, I brought my scooter with me and I just scootered home. It's like, like, and there was across town, it was like 10K and it, like that made, that scoot, scootering made it like feel like yeah. nothing. It's interesting too when you're traveling and then you're doing all the, and you're scootering and you're like skateboarding and stuff. Cause when my buddy and I skateboarded all around, we were longboarding probably for like six hours. Yes. Yeah. And we were like, you know, once we have water, we're fine. And then we're just like, man, you know, this isn't too bad. But if I were to do something at that speed, for like if I were to run for like that oh, speed not, for six hours, it'd be like, not a chance, fam. Absolutely not. Oh, it was bad. But like <laughs> uh, the first couple of weeks we walked, um, like first of the trip, like I was, I was in Rome and I think I like have it on my like, health app. It's like I did like, walk on like 40 something kilometers that day. Like we got up at like seven. And I didn't stop walking till like eleven o'clock. We saw everything by foot in your um, Spanish steps, Colosseum, Hand of Truth, all this stuff. We just walked across all of Europe and the Vatican and just to, all, all throughout Rome just to see wow. us. It was crazy. Like forty kilometers of walk yeah. in a day. Like forty thousand oh, steps. Man. It's like, oh man. Just incredible. And we kept doing that and did the same thing in Venice, but it's like, man, we get to Munich and I'm just like Walking down the road, like hanging out. We were we we're at the sports store. I was checking out some climbing gear, and James, like James, is in his forties, and he's a great guy. Stood in his wedding a couple of weeks back, and it was nice, really dude. awesome. Um, I'm definitely gonna link him to this, but it was a. Uh, I just see him, this like this middle aged, big guy coming out of a of a toy store, like a, of a climbing and like equipment store, yeah. and he's just riding a scooter like a kid. Just around, like, <laughs> doing donuts in, like, the square in Munich. Mm-hmm. I'm like, awesome. Like that's, that's it. Yeah. That sounds like no G. Yeah. And then I, I was like, no, I'm not going to buy a scooter. That's stupid. Yeah. Three days later, we're in Berlin. I'm like, I need a scooter. All right. Hey, uh, James, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dip out. I'm going to go to Toys R Us for a minute. <laughs> was it Toys R Us? There was a Toys R Us that I bought my scooter at. That's not too bad. It was good. Did they have longboards and stuff? Or where in Sudbury could I get a longboard? In Sudbury? Cause it probably sucked to ride them in here, but I'm sure they're Yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm never, uh, like, I don't scooter much, I don't like longboard much, like, at all. Um, I don't know, like, maybe start, like, Zoomies in the mall. I don't, I don't know if Sessions does, like, uh, yeah, like Sessions true. Ride Company. Right. They might have something. I think they have scooters. I could ask my buddy John, cause my buddy John runs Sessions. Okay. Yeah, he trains Jiu-Jitsu with me. Oh, sweet. So. That's something I want to get into myself. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu? I'm looking at getting into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Dude, if you're gonna try anywhere and this is my plug this is where i'm going to plug the the family the familia train it true mm-hmm. i'm that's what i'm looking at i'm 100 percent biased but i'm also 100 percent have a reason to be biased between the quality of instructors to the level of like intensity that we all train at to the variety of skills and different like weights that you have yeah like it's not just a bunch of big guys who are all purple belts it's there's a bunch of white belts a bunch of blue belts and they're all good they've all been doing it for a while they all have that experience cool. and stuff and then professor monkey is like i can only say the best things about him it's like the smartest guy Sweet. he's a brick shit house. like he's insane Sweet. he's a smart guy everything like i'm looking forward to him coming back to the gym because he just uh, fought at worlds <laughs> so yeah, so, yeah. Um, train it true. You'll love the people. You'll love the level of intensity. I know my buddy Rogan's been going. Yeah, going there, and he he's been loving it. So, like, I think that's where I'm gonna, like, when I decide whether I want to get into it or not, and like check check it out there. I know they have like a I don't know if it's a free week or a free day, whatever it is. They have free like free something just to get your foot in the door and see what it's like. So. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely hoping to check that out soon. Nice. That's a. I've been watching a lot of like. I had an ex-girlfriend who, like, their, like, her brother used to host, like, MMA nights whenever there was a fight night at their house, and I would go over for every fight night, 
uh, like I, I just really got into like watching MMA, UFC. Yeah, so I, I love it. And it's like oh, I don't care how violent it is. Like it's, I, it's awesome to watch. I find if you learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. UFC fights get turned up a lot more yeah. in terms of interest. Like I'm a lot more interested in a fight now that I have the very basic understanding of what's going on on the ground and what to look for. That's not just, oh, one guy's really good wrestler, one guy's really good boxer, let's yeah. see what happens. It's like, if they go to the ground, let's, like you, you have an, yeah, as they, much of an understanding, it's not just one dimensional, it's like whoever gets hit more. Yeah, like loses. It's like no, but yeah. now you get to see more technical, and you're looking at it, and you're enjoying a lot like more of the fights and everything. So. Yeah, no, that I find like as I've been like I've been doing a lot more research into it and just watching all that stuff, and that's the cool part is like noticing like as I research yeah. it more, it's like I appreciate. It. Like I was watching a a heavy fight a couple of <sighs> what, like, oh, like man, awesome. Yeah, dude, he's he smashes. He's a man. crazy. And it's like just watching him on the ground. It's like as soon as he like it's terrible. All like with the McGregor fight, it's like all he all he needed to do was get McGregor on the ground. Cause that's it though. And that was it. I'm like it was so cool to watch. It's terrifying that that's he does that with every single person he fights. He does it against everyone from amateurs in his beginning, not amateurs, but like not as high class and mm-hmm. in the beginning to world champions. He's just gonna pick them up right on the punch in the face. Yeah. It's like <coughs> so I know. A bunch of us probably watching that fight on um, whatever it comes out of it's in September. I know it's in Abu Dhabi, but I don't know what to the next day. Probably September fifth, seventh. Yeah. Seventh would make sense. Yeah, but I'm not sure. I think I mean. Yeah, I think it's Toronto. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty sweet. No, yeah, I'm I'm, ho- I'm excited to watch that. Gonna get the pay per view there. Try it out and let me know if you do. Yeah. And you, on the day you go, so then I'll be there. And it's, Sounds good. Yeah. Great bunch of bunch of people I have only good things to say yeah so <laughs> I lucked out too because when I asked my buddy I was like yo like Steph like where'd you train like where should I train like, I'm looking I'm moving to Sudbury now like where could I where would you recommend training he's like I'll train at Troop I was like yeah, okay sweet and then just yeah no, a year I'm, later I'm, all I've heard is good things from yeah. like different like uh, I know there's like a brand of Aster I follow like Andre uh, like what the fiel is his yeah. Instagram page, and he uh, like he he was fucking troop. Like I I think it was, and like my buddy Rogan's there, and I think his buddy Devin's. Like there's a bunch of guys I know that are like going over there, and they're they're loving it. Like so, I think I'll, I'll be checking it out soon. It's it's the it's the best. Yeah, that's it. That's all I can say. I can't really like clarify that even any more than it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> man. How long were you in Europe for? Like, how long did you do that Europe trip? Uh, I think I was there for about 31 days. 31 days? Yeah. Where'd you go? Like, what was the start of it? Like, you started in Montpellier? So, yeah, I started in Chamonix. Okay. Um, right after that was when the travels began. I took a bus from Chamonix to Geneva. I took a train from Geneva to Milan, Milan to Rome, Rome to Florence, Florence to Venice, Venice to Salzburg, Austria, Salzburg to uh, Munich, Munich to Berlin, Berlin to Hamburg. Mm-hmm. Hamburg to Amsterdam, nice. Amsterdam to Brussels, and Brussels to Paris. So I was out for a while. Okay, it's a good time. Speaking of Amsterdam, that's why I brought the Heineken. But I saw a photo on your gram about something. So, um, and so there's a photo about when you were in Amsterdam. Okay, correct. So it's this one, right? Yeah. So familiar. Now, let's go to mine and go down. And I think if I'm correct, it might be the other side. I'm shooting up. Other side of the bridge? Other side of the bridge, but then there's mine. That's so it's cool. like, that's pretty funny. Yeah, so I was like, oh shit. Like I had a friend of mine named uh, Michaela. She's on a couple weeks ago, shout out to her. She, um, <coughs> I posted a photo of Monaco. Okay. Right, when I was there. Um, and then she sent me a message on Facebook and she had, turns out that she was just in that city where I was. Yeah. Like the exact same place and took a photo and sent me the photo. She's like, yo, I was just here. It's crazy. Like, <laughs> Shit. That's sick. Where do you find though that like, what's, sir, where do you find traveling fits into like life? Like where do you think is the best time to go? Cause I find when you're young, you don't have money to do whatever you can older. Really. Like, I don't think there's any perfect time. I think it's going to be really subjective. Like, there's the guys who work nine to five every week and like six days a week. 
they're not going to have the time. Right. These guys like me who have a very kind of open schedule, who work a lot when they can, but they're in, in those free times I'm doing short trips like around, around Ontario, um, right. stuff like that. I think the perfect time to travel is really when you have time for it. I, like, I worked at Romacos for years and a lot of what my job was is I was selling people backpacking and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was selling people stuff to go to Europe. And oh, people okay. oftentimes were, I had people of all ages coming in. I thought that was awesome. It's like I had people who were really young going with their parents. I had people who were like, and that's one of the things I'm very grateful for. Growing up, my family did a lot of like, a lot of my traveling has been done with my family. Mm -hmm. Like when I was young, like, I don't know how many countries it was, but like I've been to like, some like 12 different like little islands in the Caribbean. Like, wow. like I ended a cruise when I was like eight. And then I've done like extra traveling like in that area with my family and mm -hmm. all like and the states with my family and just yeah. different things like that. And like I've gone true. to BC with my dad and like all those times I think that's awesome because I get like so I, I even like even though I was young, like I had I can still remember that. People are like right. I hear people saying like, Oh, I shouldn't take my kids traveling because like I because they're not gonna remember it. No, if I think that's absolutely like it's a bad silly. idea because yeah. no, like they're gonna remember it. Right. I think it's an awesome idea to take your kids traveling. They're going to learn a lot more there than they're going to learn, like, well, oh, I don't want them to miss school. They're going to learn a lot more out there. Yeah. I don't remember anything I learned in, I remember catching up when I was in grade two because mm -hmm. I missed, uh, like, a week. I remember doing the catch-up work. I don't remember anything that I learned during that. I remember doing the work. I don't remember any of the work, but I remember that trip. Right. I remember that trip really well. I went to Finland with my grandfather. That was awesome oh, cool. like, when I was a kid. Like, you know, all these really amazing experiences. So I really think like, and I look at this, like my dad was in his 40s when I went to Finland with him and, my, and his dad, who was in his 80s. Um, and I was, I was 12. So it's like, was that really cool that like everybody took something different out of this? So I think the perfect time to travel is really just whenever you can. Like, it's like, if you have the opportunity, you have the money and the finances, and there's always ways of doing it too. Right. People are like, I can't travel, it's too expensive. It's like, really, how much money are you spending on Tim Hortons a week? How much money are you spending on Starbucks a week? That like okay if I if I drop two dollars today on a coffee and maybe the next day like hey I spent eight, yeah, eight, eight, eight sure. dollars a week it's like okay put that away for like mm -hmm. you do that for like a year and a half and throw like any pocket change away right. there you go like you got enough money to go for a nice little trip like you might not have tons of might not seem like a lot in the moment but like after a while that adds up and you can go on a really cool trip mm -hmm. so yeah true. there's always ways of doing these tr uh, trips. Okay. That's what I think. So whenever somebody can do it, they should. Whenever somebody can do it, they should. Now to end it off, do you have a quote that you live by? Just one. Before the battery dies. Not that I could think of really. Like uh, it's a Yvonne Chouinard quote. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard is the guy who created Patagonia. Yeah. Um, and he created Patagonia and Black Diamond. Oh, cool. uh, so he's a really cool environmental. He's got a book called. Um, let my people go surfing. He's got several books out, and all, all of them are amazing. Uh, I'm gonna just I'm gonna look up the quotes. So I don't butcher it. Okay. Um, but he it was in his book let my people go surfing. I'm like that's oh man, he's got two now that I'm thinking from that book. Um, I'll say the one right from his book that because like, it'll apply more to this podcast. Sweet. Um, it's talking about when it comes to his like he's talking about his gear lineup. Yeah. And that philosophy was is like why people shouldn't buy a ton of stuff. It's like the more you know, the less you need. The more you know, the less you need. So it's like damn, that's cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. Live entrepreneur, he's awesome dude. book. It was in Let My People Go Surfing. No kidding. And it's that was, I'm like that's exactly like what I <laughs> my kind of my approach from a lot of different things. I'm gonna write them down. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Right, so the more you know, the, the less, less you need. need. Awesome, buddy. I really appreciate your time, man. Yeah.